Simonon's Maigre, a series of plays based on the novels of Georges Simonon. Tell you who I heard from yesterday, Georges. Inspector Le Duc, that was. How is he enjoying his retirement? Mm, very much. Country life down in the Dordogne seems to suit him. He's asked Louise and me down there for a holiday. Will you go, Jules? Oh, we might. Though, <laughs> the last time I tried to visit him, it was a bit of a fiasco. I ended up bedridden. You had only yourself to blame. Jumping out of a moving train is not the thing to do. Not at your age. Well, it was instinct. Police instinct. And imagine yourself trying to get to sleep in the lower bunk of a second-class couchette with the chap above you tossing and turning, moaning like anything... And then finally, after a couple of hours of that carry-on, putting his patent leather boots on and dashing off into the corridor. I just peeped out after him to see what he was up to. So would you have done if he had been in my shoes? Maybe, but I certainly wouldn't have jumped out of the train after him. <laughs> Not in the middle of a wood and in the middle of the night. No wonder he turned round and took a shot at you. Mm, and hit me. Next thing I knew, I was in a hospital bed in Bergerac. And the local police inspector, the doctor, the public prosecutor, and goodness knows who else, were all standing round accusing me of being a homicidal maniac. Maurice Denham as Jules Maigret, and Michael Goff as Georges Simonon in Maigret and the Madman of Bergerac. Translated by Geoffrey Sainsbury and adapted for radio by Aubrey Woods. A homicidal maniac. Mm. So that's the impression you made. Oh, the circumstances were unusual. I can understand you objecting to being thought homicidal, although I'm not sure the other half of the description wasn't pretty correct. Oh, thank you very much, George. Not at all. So... Poor old Le Duc had to drive over and bail you out. Oh, he was very good about it. He knew I hated hospitals, so he got me shifted into the local hotel. Louise came down and looked after me. Not much of a holiday for her. Oh, nor for me. I was stuck in bed there for about two weeks. Not the best place from which to conduct an inquiry. You shouldn't have been conducting it at all. What do you think the local police inspector was there for? No, oh, he was useless. But Le Duc was quite informative. In a nutshell? Please. I'll just <coughs> sit up. Now, be careful. Oh. That's better. <coughs> it, uh, it must have been about a month ago. They found a woman's body on one of the main roads. Mm. Strangled. But that wasn't all. Having killed her that way, whoever did it stuck a long needle right through her heart. Uh, was she robbed? No. Assaulted? No. She was a good-looking woman, too. About 30. The crime took place at nightfall as she was returning from her sister-in-law's. That's the first. Mm, there were two. Two and a half. The second was a girl of 16 who'd been out for a ride on her bicycle. She was found in the same state. At night? She wasn't found till next morning, but she'd been killed the evening before. Then, lastly, there was one of the maids from this hotel, um, Rosalie. She was on foot. Suddenly someone seized her from behind and threw her down. She's a big, strapping girl. She caught hold of the man's wrist and uh, bit him. Mm. He swore and made off. She only saw his back as he ran into the bushes. And that's all? Well, so far. Mm. But the people here are convinced there's a maniac roaming about in the woods. They refuse to believe it could be one of themselves. So, when the news got around that you'd been found shot, everybody thought you were the murderer and they won't get the idea out of their heads easily. Who's in charge of the case? Well, the local people in these little towns. Ah, but don't forget, my dear Le Duc, that this little town is different from any other. It's a little town with a madman, a madman at large, a madman who's only mad by fits and starts. Well, the rest of the time, he's walking about and talking to people just like anybody else. Yes, I suppose so. Now, something else I wanted to ask you, just between ourselves. Mm. 
What facilities are there in this part of the world for enjoying the charms of the fair sex? <laughs> really, Jean? Now, don't get self-righteous, for heaven's sake. I'm a sick man. That is neither here nor there. Yeah, but the question is, mm. it's important. In the country, you don't have all the amenities of the town. How old is your cook? Well, 65. Well, no so young he's... blood around the place? No little shepherdesses? Well, there's only the cook's niece who comes from time to time to lend her a hand. 16, 18? 19. But really, I... The prosecutor, you are so. He's a bachelor, I understand. Now, how does he manage? Do you think he relates his peccadillas to everyone he meets? This isn't Paris, you know. Yes, I had noticed. But everything gets round sooner or later. Well, I only know what people say. <laughs> there you are. <clears throat> they say he goes once or twice a week to Bordeaux, where he... Um... <clears throat> you know what you ought to do? Huh? Start a little investigation of your own. See if you can find who was away for Bergerac last Tuesday. After all, you've been at the police yourself. Yeah, now, now look here, Jules. Uh, joke's all very well, but this one's gone far enough. Uh, are you seriously suggesting that in a little place like this, where the least thing will set tongues wagging, I should start nosing around like a... Uh, well, well, I won't, that's all. Mm. The local police have taken the case in hand. It's, it's nothing whatever to do with me. And if you want to get mixed up... In something which is no business of mine... Yeah. Well, perhaps you're right, but just imagine how you'd feel if in two or three days' time that little 19-year-old of yours is found with a needle through her heart. Come in. Have I interrupted you? Oh. Uh, no, my dear. I was uh, I was just leaving, Madame Maigret. I haven't yet done my marketing. Uh, au revoir, Jules. Mm. I'll pop my head in again tomorrow. Uh, thank you, Le Duc, and keep your ears open. Yes. Well, I, I'll, I'll see. Mm. Now, any news? Not really. But uh, Rosalie, the chambermaid, gossips a little. Your doctor, Dr. Rivo, apparently lives with his wife and his sister-in-law on the edge of town. They say the sister-in-law is just as much his wife as the real one. Ah. Now, anything about the prosecutor? Monsieur Durso? Not as yet. But I believe Rosalie used to work for him once upon a time. I'll have another chat with him. <laughs> we'll make an inspector of you yet. <laughs> no, thank you. Why didn't you use your free travelling pass? What do you mean? When? When you travelled down here. But I did. What have you got there? There's a mat in the passage just outside our door. I moved it just now and found this railway ticket. Under the mat? Well, just at the edge. It's second class, Paris to Bergerac, dated last Tuesday. Hmm... Get a pencil and paper. Now, who's been to see me here? Uh, make a list of them. Uh -huh. First of all, the proprietor of the hotel. Mm -hmm. And then the doctor. doctor. And the prosecutor came to make his little apology. The local police inspector. Uh, who else? There's Le Duc. Ah, quite right. Put him down. Le Duc. And uh, get the station master on the phone. Well, of course, Could you give uh, the, me the servants, local station master, for that please? matter, anyone Thank staying you. here uh, might sorry, have dropped... Sorry, hmm? You were saying? No, well, any visitor to the hotel might have dropped that as they went along the passage. But there's no reason for them to be in the passage. Well, why not? Because it only leads to this room. Oh, is that the station master? Just a moment. Uh, Thank you, my dear. Uh, Chief Inspector Magra here, station master... Tell me, did any passengers alight from the early Paris train on Wednesday last? Nobody. Oh, thank you very much. No, no, that's all. So, that ticket must have been used by the man who jumped from the train. And that must mean one of the people who've been up here visiting me. How is he this morning, Doctor? Now, his temperature's up. 102. Oh. oh, what can you expect? It moves about too much. Oh, I get fed up lying here. And I don't need to ask you if you've been smoking. The air's thick with it. Now, let's open the window. You ought to put it together. Would that do any good? <laughs> no, I suppose not. No, oh, I shouldn't bother if I were you, Doctor. Tell me, at what intervals were our madman's crimes committed? 
Oh. Now, let me see. The first was a month ago, the second a week later, and the one that miscarried was a week later still. Mm. You know what I think? That there's a good chance another body will be found in the next day or two. If not, it means the chap feels he's being watched. But if there is another... Well? Well, it might enable us to eliminate some people. Suppose, for instance, you were in this room at the time the crime was committed. Well, that would put you out of the running straight away. Hmm. Suppose the prosecutor was at Bordeaux, the police inspector in Paris, the landlord downstairs in his kitchen, and the duke, anywhere you like. You confine the suspects to the handful of people you've come into contact with? No, not even as many as that. My list is, in fact, restricted to the people who've been to see me here in the hotel who could have dropped a railway ticket. As a matter of fact, where were you last Tuesday? Hmm. Last Tuesday? I think... Uh... Oh, wait a minute. Yes, I, I drove over to La Rochelle for the... Am I to consider myself under examination? <laughs> in that case, I warn you, Now, Chief take Inspector. it easy, Doctor. Don't forget that I've nothing to do all day long, and I'm used to living in a world of activity. So I've invented a little game to keep my mind busy. It's called Madman. And you'll admit there's nothing to prevent a doctor being a madman. Huh. Oh, a madman a doctor, come to that. Oh, by the way, you haven't seen this. Hmm? What is it? Mm, it's a notice. One of the hotel staff is out at this very moment posting copies at various vantage points in the town. I'll, I'll read it to you. At 9 a.m. on Thursday morning, that's tomorrow, at the Hotel Longueterre, Chief Inspector Maigret will give a hundred francs reward to anyone giving information concerning the murders that have recently been committed in the neighbourhood of Bergerac, apparently by some demented person. I don't know whether the murderer is demented, Chief Inspector, but I'm rapidly coming to the conclusion that you are. Hmm? Do you honestly expect anyone to come? Yes. Hmm. What's the time? Five past nine. Oh. I think the doctor was right, you know. Yeah, saying that I was mad. No, though we are behaving very strangely. No, I just agree with him. I don't think anyone will come. Ah, oh. come in. Ah, the Duke. <laughs> Good morning, Monsieur. Um, are you feeling better? Oh, fine, thanks. Except for my back, which is as stiff as a poker. Have you seen my notice? What notice? Oh, I'm holding a reception here. I've even invited the madman. Hmm. Come in. Ah, Monsieur the Proprietor, what can I do for you? It's about that notice. Are you something to tell me? If I'd had anything to tell the police, I wouldn't have waited until you offered a reward. What I wanted to ask was whether we were to show up everybody who came. Yeah, by all means. He'll be back again presently. What for? Oh, hanged if I know, but he'll come all right when everybody's here. He'll find some pretext, rather. Now, what time does the prosecutor go to work? Nine, I suppose. Mm, I shouldn't be surprised if he looked in on us at his way. As for the doctor, you can take it from me, he's dashing round the wards as fast as his legs will carry him. And then, if the police inspector turns up, it'll complete the list. What list? Oh, the prosecutor, the inspector, the doctor, the proprietor of the hotel... And you. Still on that tack. Now, look here, <laughs> make that fish. <clears throat> Come in. Oh, good morning, Monsieur D'Orso. Good morning. I heard about your notice, mm? and I thought I'd better see you first. Of course, it's understood you're acting in a private capacity. Even so, I should have liked to have been consulted, considering that this is a case that's being investigated officially. Well, did you take the prosecutor's hat and stick? Oh, Who sit down? Yes, sir. Come in. Ah, Doctor. Huh. Quite a council of war. Yes, indeed. Eh? It's one of the chambermaids who wants a word, Chief Inspector. Mm. Uh, thought I'd best bring her up myself. Yes, of course. Uh, come in, uh, Rosalie, isn't it? Y yes, sir. Now, uh, sit down. Uh, you're <coughs> the girl who was attacked. Hmm? Yes. He came up behind me. I, I was walking back from my brother's place at... And I felt a hand slipping round under my chin, and over I went. But I bit him for all I was worth. Did you notice anything about him? There was a gold ring on one of his fingers. Did you see him? Not properly. He dashed off into the trees, so I only saw his back. You wouldn't be able to recognise him, then? No. Would you be able to recognise the ring? No. And you've no idea who it was that assaulted you? 
No. Mm. I'll give her a hundred francs, the Duke. <coughs> mm. Now, you don't mind acting as my secretary, do you? Uh, uh, no. Oh, thank you, sir. Next, please. If we handed out money like that, we'd have the council down on us in no time. You're really expecting to find something out, Chief Inspector? Oh, dear me, no. Nothing at all. Well, in that case, I... I told you the madman might be coming, if not several madmen. You think I was mistaken? I must see my brother. Yes, hmm? yes, A moment, gentlemen. I don't think we're finished yet. Jacques! Francoise, what is it? What's happened? Your sister-in-law, Doctor. I've seen him. He tried to... It's all right, Francoise. It's all right. It was over in the Moulin de Food. I was walking along I when... thought we'd find out something. You saw him, I suppose? Not very well. I, I don't know how I managed to shake him off. He must have tripped... Anyway, he loosed his grip for a moment, and I broke free. I hit him. What did he look like? I don't know. Some sort of a tramp, old clothes. One thing I'm sure of. It was no one I'd ever seen before. He ran away? I heard a car passing along the road. He must have heard it, too. He disappeared into the woods. I didn't stop running all the way here. Yeah, wouldn't it have been quicker to go home? I knew there was nobody there except my sister. This proves one thing, anyhow. The madman didn't accept your invitation after all. I suppose you don't want us anymore. Excuse me. Uh, Megre. Oh, yes, he is. It's for you, Doctor. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> Rivo here? I see. Yes, thank you. I'll be there. They found him. Who? Oh. The man, the, the madman, or rather his corpse, in the Moulin Neuf Wood. They think he's been dead several days. In that case, who was it attacked you, Mademoiselle Francoise? Did you manage to see much? Oh, yes. The gendarme let me get quite close. He was lying at the foot of a tree. Patent leather boots? Yes. Uh, and thick grey socks, hand-knitted. How old? Middle-aged or elderly, but I really couldn't say. He's been lying there at least a week. Or that's what they were saying, anyway. Nobody recognised him, so he seems to be a stranger. Was he wounded? A huge hole in the side of his head. How was he dressed? In black, a black overcoat. It was horrible. But if, if you want me to go back, No, I... no, my dear. Come in. Ah, oh, good evening, Le Duke. Good evening, Monsieur. Madame Maigret. Do sit down. Oh, uh, thank you. Well, well. So, there we are. Hmm? Please? You, well, that's not... Oh, so come good. on, you all are. You, the doctor, the prosecutor, the police inspector, all of you delighted at the way I've been made a fool of. <laughs> That troublesome detective from Paris who thought he'd chuck his weight about. Thought himself very clever. Where still other people began to think he might be. And some people began to get quite nervous about it. But that's all over now. He's merely made an ass of himself and served him right. You admit then that... Uh, that I was mistaken? Well, they found the man, haven't they? And he corresponds to your description of the man in the train. There's a bullet hole in the side of his head and it seems to have been fired at close quarters. Yes. So close that Monsieur Dursault and the police agree that everything points to suicide. They think it was quite a week ago, perhaps immediately after he shot you. They found a gun beside him, then? Uh, oh, no. That is the only snag. Mm. There was a revolver in his pocket, and with only one cartridge fired. Yeah, the one that nearly did for me. Well, that's what they want to find out. Certainly, if it's suicide, it goes a long way towards clearing up the case. Realising someone was after him, he saw the game was up and... Um... And uh, if it's not suicide? Oh, well, there are other possible explanations. He may have assaulted someone who was armed, someone who killed him quite properly in self-defence, but was nevertheless too frightened to say anything about it. It would be just like these country people. Hmm. And Francoise, what about her little adventure this morning? We hadn't forgotten that. We think it might have been no more than a... A spiteful, practical joke. I see. What everyone wants is to get the case over and done with as speedily as possible. No, it's not that. But you must see there's no point in dragging things on now. Well, there's still that second-class ticket I told you about. Somebody will have to find an explanation for that. Now, how did it jump out of a dead man's pocket into a corridor at the Hotel d'Angleterre? Do you want some good advice? 
to let the whole thing drop. That's it, isn't it? Mm. To get well and then clear out of Bergerac as soon as I'm fit to travel. And come and spend a few days with me as you were intending to do in the first place. I've spoken to Dr. Rivo about it, and he says that with proper precautions, there's no reason why you shouldn't be moved now. What does the prosecutor say? Hmm? I don't understand. Oh, I'm sure he had something to say about it. Didn't he say that I had no right whatever to poke my nose into the case? Now, you must realise that according to the regulations... If... Look, I, I may as well put it plainly. With that little comedy of yours this morning, you've succeeded in putting everybody's back up. Once a week, the prosecutor has dinner with the prefect of police, and he says that he'll speak about you so that you have your knuckles wrapped by your superiors in Paris. <laughs> What irritated them more than anything was the way you tried to, to chuck those hundred-franc notes about. They say that... that I'm encouraging the dregs of the population to wag their tongues. How did you know? That I'm inciting them to sling mud at respectable people. If only you had some real idea to work on. I, I'd feel differently about it. But, but I haven't. Or rather, I've four or five. Two of them looked very promising this morning, then all of a sudden they went up in smoke. You see? So what about it? Will you come over to my place? Well, I'd love to. We both would, but not till it's all over. <laughs> but now that the madman's dead... Is he? Now, you run along, and if they ask you what I intend to do, say you don't know. Can't you persuade him, Madame Maigret? I'm sure he's wrong. I'm not as sure as you are. Good night. <sighs> Good night. <laughs> Thank you, my what dear. What for? What you said to Le Duc. I was almost beginning to doubt myself. Of course you're not wrong. Shall I fill your pipe for you? Ah, thank you. What's for supper? Wait and see. Uh, come in. Ah, good morning, Le Duc. Good morning. Look, Jules, hmm? I met the prosecutor in the street, and he gave me some extraordinary news. I, I went to the police station to make sure it was true. Oh, let's hear it. They sent the fingerprints to Paris, as a matter of course, uh, and the answer has just come. Well, go on. The dead man, the man who jumped out of the train, he died years ago. What are you talking about? Well, officially, this corpse that's lying in the mortuary has been a corpse for years. Hmm? He was a man called Samuel, who was condemned to death in Algiers. And executed? Uh, no. No, he was supposed to have died in hospital a few days before his execution date. Now, what else do the police know about him? Well, they don't know exactly where he came from. Somewhere in Eastern Europe. He had a business in Algiers. What sort of business? Postage stamps. Oh, that was only a cover for another business, of course. But it was so well done that though the police were watching him, they didn't find out anything until he was on trial for murder. Then it came to light. His real business was supplying forged passports, immigration papers and labour permits. He had a whole network of agents in Vienna, Bucharest, Warsaw, all over the shop. Mm, strange. Very, very strange. Why so strange, Jules? Oh, not his profession, but to run up against it in a place like Bergerac. It all started off as an ordinary provincial case, the local maniac of a small country town. Suddenly, there was all the underworld, Warsaw to Algiers. But people like Samuel, you find them everywhere. It's not a question of race, it's a question of species. Barmen in Scandinavia, gangsters in America, head waiters in Germany, wholesalers in North Africa. They see to everything for a price. And the price, as far as Samuel was concerned, was murder. There was a murder, you say? A double one. Two men from Berlin found lying dead on a bit of waste ground. There was a lot of nosing around. They found out about Samuel and his two agents. That's what the men were. The idea was they'd come to complain of something. No doubt he was doing them out of their commissions. Perhaps they threatened him. So he did away with them? It took a long time to get sufficient evidence against him, but in the end they did. And he was condemned to death. He fell ill, however. So seriously that he was moved from the prison infirmary to the town hospital where he was supposed to have died a few days later. And? Well, that's all anyone knows. Hmm. I wonder if your soul's ever been to Algiers. A 
shut that window, Jules, hmm? and get pneumonia. No. no. Well, I talked to as many people as I could this morning, but most of them know I'm your wife, and they shut up like clams. But I did my best. Mm, you always do. No. Now, what do they think about the case now? Oh, they don't know what to think. Some say that Samuel had nothing to do with it at all, that he just wanted to kill himself. First he tries throwing himself out of a train, but his nerve fails him. He hangs on. And in any case, the train isn't going fast enough. In the end, he succeeds with a revolver. And naturally, they expect the murders to go on. Have you been past the doctor's house again? Yes, but there was nothing to see. I was told something, but well, it may be of no importance at all. Two or three times a woman has visited the house, and she's thought to be Dr. Rivo's mother-in-law. A middle-aged woman, they say, and decidedly common. Well, nobody knows anything about her or where she lives, and she hasn't been seen for two years. Well, what's her name? Madame Beausoleil. <laughs> Beausoleil, what a gorgeous name. Yes. <laughs> now, my dear, there's a very boring job for you to do. What? I want you to go downstairs and find out the number of every medical school in the country, and then telephone each in turn. Ask for the registrar's office and inquire whether anyone of the name of Jacques Riveau is on their list of qualified men. Where is the telephone downstairs? There's a box in the lounge, but it doesn't stop people hearing every word you say. Oh, splendid. But you don't mean to say that Riveau isn't a... Good heavens. Mm. Uh, will you get me Inspector Le Duc, please? Now run along, it'll be too late. Why can't I telephone from up here? Because I want to make a couple of calls and you're the only one who's mobile. <laughs> Go on. All right. <laughs> uh, your Duke, I tell me something. Do you know if Monsieur Diotto often dines with the Rivos? Oh, every Monday, you're sure? <laughs> no, I don't doubt your word. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, tomorrow, yes. Mm. Monday night, clean white cloth, a table for four. Monday night. And it was the following night I travelled down from Paris with Samuel. Only I didn't know it then. And then the night after that, or rather early Wednesday morning, Samuel was killed. Police judiciaire. Ah, uh, did you find out if Dr. Rivo received a call from Paris last Tuesday week? Uh, you did? Good. At two in the afternoon, yes. The restaurant des Quatre, Place de la Bastille, a nine minute call. Right, thank you. Hmm, the train left at five forty. Why did he jump? Was it to escape from somebody or to meet somebody? That's the problem. Jules, hmm? we must call in another doctor at once, a real one. It's simply monstrous. It's a crime. And to think, how do you feel? Well, all right. Why? No one has ever qualified under the name of Jacques Riveau. Ah. He simply isn't a doctor. Hmm. Every register has been searched. And now we're getting to the bottom of it. That temperature for yours that wouldn't go down... Well, of course the wound wouldn't heal. Mm, it was to meet somebody. Yes? Good evening, Chief Inspector. Ah, good evening, Monsieur Dorso. Uh, won't you sit down? Ah, thank you. I must confess I've been feeling a bit guilty about you. That surprises you, does it? I couldn't help reproaching myself for having been rather curt. Though I must admit that your own manner is sometimes rather disconcerting. Oh, I apologise. So I thought I'd look in to tell you how we were getting on. In two or three days at the outside, we'll have the case finished and filed. The facts speak for themselves. We must keep to the point. How Samuel dodged execution and had somebody else buried in his place, that's for the Algiers people to go into, if they think it worthwhile, which I don't for a moment suppose they will. You think Samuel escaped from Algiers, came to France, to Bergerac, committed a couple of murders and then shot himself? Hmm? Exactly. And the fact that no revolver was found by his side doesn't bother me in the least. There are dozens of cases on record where the same things happened. Somebody passed and picked it up. A tramp, perhaps, or a child, and never said a word about it. 
Too scared to come forward? You think so? Yes. Hmm. The important thing in this case was to make sure the gun had been fired close to the head, and the post-mortem leaves no doubt on that point. And there I'm sure the case will rest. So what are your plans now? Oh, the same as ever. You mean to arrest the murderer, of course. You are very obstinate, Inspector. Oh, I know. I think I should warn you. I shouldn't bother if I were you, Monsieur Dorso. Warnings are one of the few things I very seldom heed. (laughs) Good day, Inspector. Hmm? Madame Mabry. Good day. Now, that maid, what was her name? Rosalie. That's it. Is she anywhere around? I expect so. Shall I go and find her? Would you mind, my dear? Now, I only wanted to ask you one simple question, Rosalie. Have you ever worked at Monsieur Dorsault's? I was uh, two years with him. As a housemaid? Yes. So you went all over the house polishing the floors and dusting? I did the rooms. Exactly, you did the rooms. And in doing the rooms, you must have found out a thing or two. Hmm? How long ago was it? Oh, it's a uh, year last month that I left the place. Did the prosecutor often have women visitors? I don't know. Oh, yes, you do. Now, come on, speak out. There's nothing to be frightened of. Wouldn't do anybody any good. What would? If I did speak out. Well, you see, there's my young man, Albert. I would spoil his chances. He, he's trying to get a government job, and if the prosecutor was against him, well... See what I mean? So there was a lady visitor now and again? No. No, there wasn't. Oh, come on now. There's a little bit of scandal somewhere, isn't there? Oh, and everybody knows about it. You can't keep things dark forever. Oh, it was a good two years ago. A parcel came from Paris. But when they came to look at it, the label was half torn away and they couldn't tell who it was for. And there was no sender's name on it either. Well, they waited a week, thinking someone might turn up to claim it. Then they opened it. Never guess what they found. Mm, well, I think perhaps I can. Photographs, mm. but um, not ordinary ones. Um, hardly know how to say it. Uh, women um, with no clothes on, and not alone either. And um, see what I mean? Yeah. Go on, Rosalie. And, and then one day, another parcel came. Just the same as the first one. Same paper, same string, same label as the bit that had been left before. Guess who it was addressed to? Monsieur Du or so, if you please. Mm. Now, listen. Not a word you say here will ever be repeated. Oh. When you heard what you've just told me, mm. you went and had a look at the books in his study, didn't you? <gasps> who told you? Oh, well, since you know it already, um, yes, I did. A lot of the bookcases have doors to them with sort of wire netting and they're always kept locked. Only I once found one where the key had been left in the lock. And what did you find? You know very well what I found. Oh, it it was so awful. I had nightmares for a week. I couldn't endure Albert coming anywhere near me. Big books, were they? Handsome books? Uh, Yes, but they were all sorts of terrible ones. Things you... You'd never think of. Well, thank you, Rosalie. If your wife hadn't been here, I I should never have dreamt of talking about such things. Mm. Did Dr. Revo often come to the house? Uh, Oh, hardly ever. He used to telephone. Nor anyone of his family? No. Oh, except, of course, for Mademoiselle Francoise, the time she was acting as his secretary. But the prosecutor? Yes. How long did that last? Oh, about uh, six months. Uh, after that, she went off to her mother's in uh, Paris or Bordeaux. I'm not sure which. And it was ever so long before we saw her in the town again. And uh, Monsieur D'Orso never overstepped the mark in his dealings with you? He'd have caught it if he had. Well, Rosalie, thank you for what you've told me. Now, don't be frightened. You won't get into any trouble over it, and uh, Albert will never know you came here. Oh, <laughs> Thank you, monsieur. Oh, uh, uh, Inspector. No, monsieur will do. Oh, dear, oh, dear. To think an educated, intelligent man, and in such a responsible job, too. Mm, I know, my dear, I know. 
But now, would you take down an advertisement? I want you to put in the Bordeaux papers for me. Of course. Are you ready? Uh, yes. Now, uh, a certain Madame Beausoleil, formerly of Algiers, now believed in Bordeaux, right, is urgently requested mm -hmm. to present herself at once at the following address where she will learn something to her advantage. Right. Maigret, solicitor, Hotel d'Angleterre, Bergerac. Ah, Madame Beausoleil, please take a chair. And you too, Mademoiselle Françoise. I warn you, I shall complain. It's unheard of. Oh, calm yourself, Mademoiselle, and forgive me for wanting to see your mother. Who said she was my mother? Oh, I took it for granted. The fact that you went to meet her at the station. Does somebody mind telling me what this is all about, being picked up at the station like that? Are you a solicitor or a policeman? A policeman. I know your face, madame. Were you ever a singer? Oh, yes, monsieur. I sang at Olympia. Of course. I remember the name Josephine. <laughs> yes, how nice of you to remember. But the doctors recommended a warmer climate, and I went on tour. Italy, Turkey, Syria, Egypt. And you pitched up in Algiers? Yes, I had my first daughter in Cairo. Who was her father? An English officer. Your second girl, Françoise, was perhaps born in Algiers. Yes, and that was the end of my theatrical career. I was ill for quite a long time, and though I got over it, I never recovered my singing voice. So then? Her father looked after me right up until the day he was recalled to France. He was in the customs. The inspector has no right to question you, Mother. Don't answer another word. Madame, well, you're quite at liberty to speak or not, just as you think fit. Don't say anything, Mother. You see, Inspector, what can I do? Come in. Oh. Madame Rivo. Excuse me, Inspector, but I heard my mother and sister were here. Who told you? Who? It was someone uh, someone I met. You haven't seen your husband? No. Give me that pipe, Jules. You've had quite enough. Huh? Ah. Mademoiselle Francoise, that note, please. Oh. Oh. Where's she gone? Madame Rivo, when did your husband give you that note? Uh, what note? Oh, never mind. Louise, can you see the back of the hotel from that landing window? I think so. Well, go out and watch and tell me if anything happens. I think Le Duc's got them. The doctor's car was at the back of the hotel, and Francoise was just getting into it when Le Duc drove up. They saw him and dashed into the hotel. Le Duc followed them. What's happening? Well, the note. He told her to join him. A minute more, and they might have made it. Jules, what? it's terrible. Well, what is it? They're dead. Oh, no. huh? Both of them. Oh, it isn't true. Uh, we dashed up here after them, but they had time to slip into one of the rooms and lock the door behind them. Then there were two shots. When we broke down the door, they were both dead. Oh. Someone's telephoning the hospital. Well, I'm very sorry, madame. She was your favourite, wasn't she? Of course. She had the looks. When the doctor married her sister, she was too young, barely 13. But later, he fell in love with her, and then she had the child. What child? A daughter. Monsieur D'Orso's daughter. Was Dr. Rivo practising in Algiers, madame? Yes. What was his connection with this man, Samuel? He was his son. Son? And he arranged his father's escape from the hospital. That's right. There were only two patients in that wing of the hospital. One night, Rivo set the place on fire, and it was the other man who was left in the flames and afterwards given out to be Samuel. After that, Jacques married my elder daughter. And he brought the three of you to France? Yes. And changed his name to Rivo. Samuel was shipped off to America and told never to come back. Yes. He was strange in the head even then. They said the trial had unhinged him. Oh, why did he have to come back? All this need never have happened. It need never have ended like this. It need never have started, of course, if Samuel hadn't murdered his associates. And his son hadn't helped him escape. And then fallen in love with his wife's sister. Mm. Duorso discovered something about the doctor's past life. After that, there was nothing anyone could do. Events just ran their course. 
That child Francoise had, do you believe it was Dursault's? Not for a moment. They had an affair, of course, engineered by Rivaux. He knew of the prosecutor's taste in pornography, thought he'd be easy game for Francoise, and he was. So, when she became pregnant by Rivaux, I imagine, she convinced Dursault that the child was his and used that to ensure he didn't delve any deeper into Rivaux's past. But Samuel suddenly popping up in Bergerac when he was supposed to be safely away in America must have put the cat among the pigeons. Mm. He'd been suspected of two murders over there. Both strangulations, both found with a needle stuck through the heart. So he fled the country. And when he repeated the whole mad business over here, Rivaux decided to get rid of him. Nothing was to stand between him and his ambition. Certainly not a criminal lunatic of a father. So when Samuel insisted on coming down here again, his son told him that the police in Bergerac were waiting for him. He was to jump from the train before it reached the station. Rivaux must have been surprised to see two of you. Mm. But he killed Samuel just the same and emptied his pockets of everything that could identify him, including a railway ticket. <laughs> I may be wrong, but I can't help thinking that one day he'd have shoved his wife off into a better world too. And then he could have married Francoise, the girl he loved who'd given him a daughter, the girl who was ready to do anything for him, to simulate that faked attack in the wood in order to clear him of suspicion, and finally to die with him rather than lose him. Yes. Did you ever take your holiday with Le Duc? No. I didn't fancy staying on after that. At least Louise didn't. I got myself out of bed that night, and we had our last dinner ever at the Hotel d'Angleterre. Trouffe en serviette, foie gras, and a bottle de Perignon. But you don't like champagne. I know, but seeing my wife had done all the donkey work on this case, I thought she deserved the sort of meal she likes for once. Did she enjoy it? Yes. But I think she enjoyed the journey back home even better. She's not really cut out to be an inspector. In Maigret and the Madman of Bergerac by Georges Simenon, translated by Geoffrey Sainsbury, and adapted for radio by Aubrey Woods. Maigret was played by Maurice Denham, and Simenon by Michael Goff. Madame Maigret, Irene Sutcliffe. Du Orso, Malcolm Hayes. Le Duc, Timothy Bateson. Dr. Riveau, Gavin Campbell. Madame Riveau, Anne Rosenfeld. Francoise, Jane Knowles. Madame Beausoleil, Joyce Latham. Rosalie, Nicolette Mackenzie. Hotel proprietor, Geoffrey Siegel. The play was produced and directed by Betty Davis. Mm -hmm.